Hello, everyone, and welcome to Civic Cocktail. My name is Whitney Keys. I'm the executive director of Seattle City Club. 40 years ago, eight women created our nonprofit to help people have access to elected officials who are making decisions that impact our region and share civic information. And around that same time in the 1980s, I was a 13-year-old kid growing up in Tacoma, Washington. And I lived close to the Puyallup Indian Reservation, but I really never knew much about that community. Years later, I learned that the land I grew up on and all the land near the present day site of the Tacoma Dome was the home of tribal people known as the Spuyalapabsh. In 1854, their leaders were asked by the US government to sign away their tribal lands in a language they didn't know and through documents that they couldn't read. And this is really why I'm committed to learning more about issues impacting tribes and supporting native communities. And as a part of our ongoing diversity, equity, and inclusion work, Seattle City Club respects tribal history, and we reflect native voices and expertise in our programs, bringing together different people with diverse perspectives. This program is just one way that we do that. And so I wanna thank Comcast, they're our presenting sponsor, and they support our mission deeply. I also want to recognize the Seattle Channel as our longtime media partner and Town Hall Seattle as our nonprofit program partner. Looking ahead on March 19th, we are hosting the first of a three part series of virtual civic boot camps to learn more about the lack of affordable housing and the impact of homelessness in our community. And be sure to mark your calendars for Thursday, April 1st, when Civic Cocktail returns again and we're going to explore the future of the Democratic Party with Congresswomen Pramila Jayapal and Suzanne Delbeni. Check out our website or social media for more information. When Civic Cocktail begins in just a few minutes, we invite you to be a part of the conversation by typing your questions in the chat box. We read all of them and we will do our best to incorporate them. And we're trying something new at the end of this program. The live stream is gonna continue for about 15 minutes and we are just gonna focus on your questions for our guests. As always, we're committed to ensuring this is gonna be a civil, thoughtful exchange of ideas. This has been a very tough year for nonprofits, especially event-based ones like Seattle City Club and Town Hall. So please consider making a gift to help us continue to produce programs like this one. You can donate online or text to give. Just text the word civics to the number 44321. All right, it's time to join our host and journalist, Joni Balter, and meet our guests for this civic cocktail program. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to March Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter, so pleased to be here with two guests who know how sharply divided our politics can be, but who also have some ideas about how we can honestly come together on a few matters. Our guests this evening are Tina Podlodowski, Chairwoman of the Washington State Democratic Party, and Caleb Heimlich, Chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. Thank you both so much for joining us. In a Super Bowl TV ad, music legend Bruce Springsteen travels to a small chapel in the center of the country to plea. We can make it to the mountaintop, through the desert, and we will cross this divide. If rock stars are modern day philosophers, is it helpful that Springsteen urged us to become the reunited states of America? I'm gonna start with you, Caleb. Well, good evening, Joni. Thank you very much for having me on. It's great to be with you and with Tina. Um, my, I, in talking with a lot of Republicans, what they saw in that ad, and one of, I think, the barriers to bridging the divide and bringing people together is we'll see media, we'll see cultural leaders call for unity after Democrats win. Uh, but I would argue that that ad never would have run if President Trump had been reelected. Re so if we're going to have real unity, if we're going to work together, I think we first have to put aside preconceived notions that Republicans kind of drop their partisanship and give up on all of their principles and come and agree with everything that Democrats want. That's not unity, and that's never going to happen. Now, I would say that I agreed with some of the themes in President Biden's inaugural address and the desire uh, to have a civil politics moving forward, to have us uh, work out our disagreements to find agreement where we can. What was what was a theme that you um, agreed with when you when you heard that? 
Well, I think the, the theme in general of the idea of getting back to a politics that is a little bit less divided and where it's okay to find common ground. I think that as a theme is something that I think we should all strive towards. Well, to that point, Tina Podlodowski, um, President Biden said something um, a little bit later than that, said something similar, and I'd like to read it to you. I take issue with what everybody says about the division. The nation is not divided. You go out there and you take a look and you talk to people. You have fringes on both ends, but it's not nearly as divided as we make it out to be. What about that, Tina Podlodowski? That's your very own president talking. Uh, I mean, I agree with President Biden on that. Look, we need to talk about accountability and responsibility. If we want our democratic system to work again, we need to put aside what I think have become some very lazy intellectual habits that misrepresent what both partisanship is and what bipartisanship is. Nothing is more destructive to democracy in American politics right now than the misunderstandings and misrepresentations of both partisanship and bipartisanship. They're not yin and yang, they're not good and bad. Both functional partisanship and functional bipartisanship demands, at a bare minimum, the commitment to abide by the results of free elections, the commitment to tell the truth about those elections, and the commitment to make certain all citizens have equal opportunity to participate in the electoral process. The, the GOP, the Republicans, currently fail at all three of these things. And until they commit to those principles, functional bipartisanship is impossible. Accountability needs to happen. I mean, they've had no shortage of opportunities to commit to the Constitution, to democracy, to the opportunity for bipartisanship. They could have immediately recognized Joe Biden as the winner of the presidential election and not let the big lie that the election was still in fester. And that still happens today. I mean, if Republicans are truly interested in being bipartisan, they would be acting very differently than they have since President Biden won the election. Um, in Congress, they could have declined to object to any of those electoral votes in the certification of the Electoral College. They did not. They could have voted to impeach, convict, and disqualify the, the disgraced insurrectionist in chief, Donald Trump, if that's too subtle for folks, from, future from holding future office, but they didn't. And the two Republican congressional members in Washington who did Jamie Herrera Butler and Dan Newhouse. Now, I agree, I disagree with them on many policy positions and actions, but they have the courage to stand up for what is right and what is constitutional. And I applaud them for that. And for their troubles, well, they were censured by the Washington State Republican Central Committee by a vote of 111 to two. So I just think Republicans at this point have zero, none, not a ground to stand on in talking about bipartisanship. They have shown no signs that they're interested in that sort of collaborative politics. But well, I, I will use I will use that as the the fabulous segue there. That um, why don't each of you define bipartisanship? What does it mean to you, Caleb? What does bipartisanship mean to you? Well, to me, it means working together. It means recognizing that there are a variety of opinions in this country and that we can seek to find common ground. I would object to many of what uh, Tina just said and the mischaracterizations of Republicans. I would point out that it was Democrats that have historically objected to certifying the Electoral College, including our own Congresswoman from Seattle. She objected to certifying the Electoral College in 2016. Stacey Abrams refused to concede the governor's election in Georgia in 2018. So to say that it's only Republicans or that somehow Republicans are fomenting distrust in our democracy is ludicrous. But setting aside all of that, I think for fundamentally, look, the, the country is very divided. There are 74 million people that just voted for President Donald Trump. They deserve to have a voice in our political process. And as I said at the beginning, if the Democrats' viewpoint is that you have to abandon all of your principles, you have to give up on the people that voted for you and their concerns in order to come together, then our country is never going to come together. Well, on this point of bipartisanship, there was um, an opinion piece in the New York Times last week that made me think that maybe there's a different definition than even I use. Like, we, we generally think that bipartisanship is when you have Democrats and Republicans in Congress joining together and voting for something, then it's a bipartisan bill. 
But this this piece, um, Michelle Cottle, the, the editorial writer who wrote it, said maybe we should think of bipartisanship sometimes in terms of public support. So, for example, the COVID relief bill has 76% um, of support uh, among the American people, 60% support, this is according to Morning Consult, so it's a poll, uh, among Republicans. What about that as a and there's a sort of different way to approach it, thinking about things in terms of public support. Tina. Um, I think that there is incredible support amongst the public and hence my saying that the country isn't divided. What we have is a GOP party that had been hijacked by Donald Trump. It is still for some reason enthralled to him and won't stop a big lie around those different pieces of it. The public wants the COVID relief bill. They want uh, us to come together and solve problems. But again, you cannot do that when you're not committing to abide by the results of free elections, when you refuse to tell the truth about those elections, when you're taking away from citizens equal opportunities to participate in the electoral process. Look at what happened with Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Look at all of those things. I mean, we could stop right here and just stop the big lie for Washington state. Caleb could take a start in that direction tonight and plainly declare Joe Biden was legitimately elected and, and, uh, and denounce those in Washington state who are saying otherwise. Denounce voter suppression efforts by the GOP here in Washington and around the country. All of those are things that are the first step to getting us to sitting down and having uh, civil conversations about this. I mean, historically, bipartisanship uh, has been something that has emerged when crises have, have abounded. That was blown up by Donald Trump and his entire administration. They broke the back of bipartisanship with a lack of action on the COVID pandemic. Um, and it'll stay that way until we can get back to something where we agree, where we have values about what's in the Constitution regarding elections and accepting elections, and what's in the Constitution about having every American have that right to vote and have that right to vote respected. Well, one of the best things going this week, for example, on bipartisanship has to do with Merrick Garland. Uh, he is very likely to be approved by a healthy number of Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and as the new U.S. Attorney General, and uh, so why? Why? Am, I'd like to hear this from you, Caleb. Why? Why is Merrick Garland uh, someone who appeals to both Republicans and Democrats? Well, I think what you're seeing from Republicans in the Senate is they're willing to give uh, a fair hearing. They're willing to listen to someone's credentials, to qualifications, and approve. They're willing to. They take seriously. They roll according to the Constitution of giving advice and consent. I think what you've seen in the past is Democrats blow up what used to be a bipartisan process when it comes to confirming nominees, when it comes to confirming U.S. Supreme Court nominees, when it comes to confirming some of President Trump's nominees. But I think in the case of Merrick Garland, I think you're seeing from Republicans a willingness to work across the aisle. And I'd point out that under in 2020, we had two, not just one, but two COVID relief packages that passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. One of them got over 90 votes in the U.S. Senate signed by President Trump. So this idea that Republicans are unwilling to reach across the aisle and work with the other side is preposterous. What we've seen from President Biden since he took office is over 50 executive orders not being willing to work with Republicans in any meaningful way on COVID relief, which is why you had two Democrats vote against the current package in the House. And so I think what, what we're seeing with Merrick Garland, again, is Republicans are willing to listen, they're willing to vet, they're willing to vote for qualified people. And we're seeing that in the case of Merrick Garland. What we're not seeing from Biden and Democrats in, on the COVID relief bill is a willingness to take input. Of that $1.9 trillion COVID relief package, over half of it doesn't go to anything related to COVID. So, Caleb, apropos of nothing other than the fact that you and I discussed this, do you want Donald Trump to lead the GOP ticket in 2024? I mean, uh, my personal opinion is I would rather see somebody else in 2024. But, I mean, ultimately, I don't get to choose. Uh, that is a, a vote of the people. Um, but I think that for the party, we would be uh, more successful uh, with a different candidate. Tina, in the interest of bipartisanship and a little friendliness, can you say something nice right now about Caleb? 
Uh, you know, I think that Caleb has done uh, a good job in leading his party in those different places. But again, I'm, I do believe that we are in a place where we just don't have a values match. Look, I asked Caleb, can he say Joe Biden won the election fair and square? He won't say that. He won't denounce people in his party. Caleb, do you want to say if Joe Biden won the election fair and square? Sure, I'll say. I mean, the 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 election is over. Joe Biden is clearly the president of the United States. I think we all should value one of the values that we should all share in common is that our election process is transparent. The reality is over 50 percent of Republicans right now don't believe the election was fair. So I would like to see us take <laughs> steps to show the truth. If it was fair, then you should have nothing to hide. Then we should have transparency. Currently today, Democrats in the U.S. House are still contesting a congressional election in Iowa. I mean, it's not like to say that it's only Republicans that still fight out elections. Uh, so I think that fundamentally, we should have confidence in the integrity of our election. We should have audits that are public and, and that we can show people. I think transparency will show I've been on the record supporting Kim Wyman multiple times. I think she has done a fantastic job. I think that uh, the elections in Washington were fair. I think the, the results were what they were. Um, our side didn't win as many as I would have liked and that and we're abiding by those. Caleb, can I get you to say something nice about Tina Podlodowski right now? Yeah, I think she's been a, a very impressive fundraiser for the state Democratic Party. They've raised a, a lot of money, and that's uh, my hat's off to her for that. So um, uh, your former uh, candidate for governor in 2016, Bill Bryant, was on this show uh, in February. And he, he made a pretty good case that, in general, the uh, Washington state GOP is, is different from the national GOP. It's just more moderate. Do you agree with that, Caleb? I think there is a there is a definitely a flavor of Republicanism in Washington state that can be different than in D.C. Absolutely. I think we uh, can be a little bit more pragmatic. I think, look, you could look at just this legislative session. There have been four or five big issues that we've had bipartisan support down in Olympia. Uh, there was a data privacy bill that just passed the Senate today, sponsored by Reuven Carlisle. It got 48 out of the 49 votes So Republicans. Uh, working with Democrats to protect people's privacy. You've seen Republicans in Washington state fighting for the working families tax credit. Uh, this was a policy put in place by the Democrats to give working families a tax break and Republicans in their budget are fighting to fund it. And I think that's an area where we have some common ground and where Republicans are willing to work uh, to address the unfairness of our tax code when it comes to those low income, hardworking Washingtonians. So I think what you would what I would argue is when I'm talking to people, I think Washington state Republicans have a little bit of a different flavor. And when you get to a more localized level, you're seeing some real strong leaders that are focused on pragmatic, solution oriented leadership, um, like we're seeing out of Bruce Stanmeyer in Pierce County, like we're seeing out of Nate Nearing in Snohomish County, who was elected by his peers to chair the Snohomish County Council by his peers being Democrats voted uh, to have him as the chair. So absolutely, I think you see Republicans focused on solving problems, and that's our key to success in Washington state. So I want to come back to Nate Nearing, but first I have a question for Tina Podlodowski that has to do with the divide in the Democratic Party. Um, some people say both parties are at least two parties or many, many parties within one party. Uh, the Democrats um, also have divides that could rear their head at any minute here, um, even, even on the COVID relief bill and the, and the $15 minimum wage. Are you prepared for that, Tina Podlodowski? You know, um, uh, let me get to that in a second, Joni, but I do want to talk about a few things. And, and since um, Caleb has filibustered for a few minutes here, I hope I have the, the same leeway to be able to do that. Let's start with the beginning here, which is um, Caleb did not say that plainly that Joe Biden was legitimately elected and that he would denounce those in the Washington state GOP that are saying otherwise and would denounce voter suppression efforts. He danced around those things. He refuses to say them. He talks about bipartisanship when it comes to Merrick Garland and a fair hearing. But let's go back to uh, what happened to Merrick Garland uh, when he was nominated for the Supreme Court. He didn't get a fair hearing. What's the difference between right now and what's the difference between the past? 
the Mitch McConnell, um, you know, the Senate under Mitch McConnell, where all good things went to die, Mitch McConnell refused to give Merrick Garland a hearing. What's different now is that Democrats have 50 seats in the Senate and the, t the tie-breaking vote with Kamala Harris. So uh, l let's not talk about all these wonderful things that the Republicans are doing because they are not doing them in any way, shape, or form. Look, uh, you talk about the different form of, of uh, what's been happening in the Republican Party in Washington state. I, I said it before, Jamie Herrera Butler and Dan Newhouse, who I'm gonna say are the Republicans that you can reach across the aisle and have a conversation with and look at how you have policies that benefit different people. Those two folks had the courage to stand up and do what is right and vote for the impeachment of Donald Trump. And for their trouble, the Washington State Republican Party censured them 111 to 2. That is not um, something that's close. That's not something that, uh, you know, is is in the realm of, uh, of a possibility that shows anything other than a party that's extreme. I mean, we really... Okay, but we're, we're actually not here tonight to just kind of just wail on them. I, we're here to talk about ways that we, um, you know, can come together. I think it's a legitimate question. Just a minute. I think it's a legit. I think it's legitimate for Caleb to to reconcile these very important issues that are. But let me let me do the questioning. And so the question that you've raised in in a way, and I'll and I'll I'll take it a little bit further here, is that when we talk about, you know, bipartisanship or getting along better, it is true that a bigger tent is is better for each of your parties. So because you need you need independence to get elected around here. Uh, so on the on the point of um, Jamie Herrera Butler and Dan Newhouse, uh, Caleb, I, I get the sense that you have kind of mixed feelings about how they've been treated. I don't know that you'll say that, but I'm just asking you, do you have mixed feelings I mean, I, about well, that? Uh, Tina's mischaracterizing what took place. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not gonna take a lecture from someone who has no idea about the inner workings of the Republican party on what allegedly transpired. The vote was to express displeasure with the impeachment of President Trump. There was no official censure of Jamie and or Dan. Uh, so we will see what happens going forward. Look, I think that Jamie and Dan are going to have to make their case to the voters of their district, and the voters of their district will decide who represents them. And that's what's going to happen going forward. I think, I mean, the Washington State Democratic Party censured Guy Palumbo because he supported charter schools. So to say that there's only one party that takes extreme positions um, is just not true. Um, so one of the toughest one of the toughest features of politics today for me as a journalist is this issue about truth. Uh, you know, as an editorial writer, I'm very comfortable, you know, sort of arguing points about things. But the argument over the truth and I do I do want to point out, Caleb, that you did support Kim Wyman in in her, you know, stating what the election results were. Uh, but nationally, there's still there still is. A perpetuation of a, of the idea that that Joe Biden wasn't elected. So, for, for the purposes of this show, and what's very important to me, is the pot, you know how do we get to the truth? How do we? I, I would like to hear you, Caleb, address that. How do we get back to the truth? Well, I think first. So, I mean, to to answer the question, like yes, Joe Biden. I said that Joe Biden is the president. He won the election. So I'll give you that period. And two. I'm certainly not in favor of voter suppression. What I am in favor of is fair, transparent elections. And we so, should be in favor of that. And so what do you mean by that? Are you calling for some sort of investigation of no, the election? I'm saying in general, the process should be transparent. I think the I, what we saw when you're kicking observers out, that is not a transparent process. And so we should all be supporting more transparency into where our results are coming from, how the ballots are counted what the process is, what the signature verification processes are to protect from fraud, because fraud does occur. And so I think we want to put safeguards in place to stop that from happening. I think we should all agree that ballot harvesting shouldn't be happening. And so I think when you're talking about how do we come to truth, one of the ways you come to truth is have the process out in the open so that people can see it, so people can observe it. And if there's transparency, 
sunshine is the best disinfectant and people will see, okay, that is the result. Um, so that's what I support. I support, as you said, I've supported Secretary Wyman multiple times. I supported her in 2016 when she won overwhelmingly in this state. I supported her in 2020 and I've supported her since. And, and she has said herself that there was some voter fraud even in Washington State in 2018. They had 130 some documented cases. She and told me that the um, the percentage of fraud in the 2018 election was 0.04. Now that right. is ex it exists, yes. um, but out of the total number of ballots, nearly four million that were cast, that's that's not a big number. So no, but it, no, ahead, right. it's not a big number, but it, it does. It, it happens. And I'm saying we should take the steps to prevent it from happening. And if we take the steps to show the transparency of how the process actually works, I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it right now. We have a great election system in Washington state. So I think the more transparency we have, the more we showcase that to people, then you eliminate uh, and you help them see the truth. So let's just say here what Caleb, let's just repeat what Caleb has said. Caleb has said that election fraud exists. There have been study after study after study to show that election fraud does not exist in this country. He has refused to say that Joe Biden won this race fair and square. He says Joe uh -huh. Biden has won the race. I'm sorry, let me finish, please, because Caleb has filibustered on this particular issue. He has a King County chair in Joshua Freed who has started an election integrity commission. He's asserting that mail-in ballots cause fraud. This is the Washington State GOP saying this. So let's talk about this when you talk about truth, Joni, and the big lie and how you get to bipartisanship. You can't get to bipartisanship if fundamentally you have someone lying over so, and Tina, over. If fraud doesn't exist, then why did Stacey Abrams not concede in 2018? Over if and I, over I, and I, over again. You have somebody lying about this, and the Republican Party does. They will not accept the, the results of the election. They will, will not. Will you accept the Georgia 2018 elections? Will you encourage your party to accept the Iowa 2 congressional district elections that they're challenging right now? Like your party is challenging a congressional election in Congress right now. This is not what about ism. This is no, about this is a fact. No, um, this is not what about ism. This is about the fundamental component of what makes a democracy and how you can make this happen and, and do this work from uh, both the, the right part of partisanship and the component of bipartisanship. So so I'm going to I'm going to move this uh, points made points taken on on both sides completely. But I am going to um, move us along to something that I wanted to get back to, and that is the Snohomish County Council, because uh, when I was speaking with Caleb, he said, you know, one way to turn the temperature down is to talk local, think local. So in, in local government, as we know, we all want basics. We want parks. We want the recycling picked up. And we do have this example in Snohomish County where, you know, they pick among themselves uh, their chair chairperson each year and they pick Nate Nearing, the Democratic controlled Snohomish Council pick a Republican. And so why is that hopeful? Um, first, first, Caleb, and then Tina, I'd love to hear you talk about that as well. Well, I think it's hopeful because it shows that people can work together. And like you said, when we get to local levels, when people, I mean, Republicans care about parks too. Republicans care about the garbage being picked up on time. Republicans care about safe communities for their kids. Republicans care about good schools. So there are a lot of issues where we do actually agree and the, and we're not as divided. And that's where I'd agree with what uh, President Biden said. There is some uh, areas of agreement in this country. And I think the local, the more localized you get, the more you're able to find that level of agreement. And I think this whole conversation so far in a half an hour, Tina wants to turn everything to Washington, D.C. And that's what she wants to talk about. And that's frankly what Democrats do surrounding elections in Washington state. Everything is always about Trump. Everything is always about D.C. instead of talking about local issues, local concerns. And if we if we do that, it does turn down the temperature a little bit. And frankly, Republicans have been more successful in winning around those issues. Tina, yeah, I think we're talking about two different sets of values here, right? The vast majority of Republicans, including here in Washington state, when you think about the Senate Freedom Caucus, Doug Erickson, Mike Padden, Phil Fortunato, Jim McCune, when you think about people uh, like um, 
Robert Sutherland and Jim Walsh and their bombastic pronouncements, they don't have an actual governing agenda. In fact, you know, since uh, maybe since they hate our constitutional form of government so much, maybe they should stop trying to run it. Um, the Republican Party has spun off to a culture war and grievance party. And that's because of a distraction from uh, uh, their lack of direct policies that would improve the lived lives and, oper oper and economic opportunities of all voters in Washington state. Or look at it another way. The GOP is trying to distract voters from its fundamental opposition to achieving those goals of equity and equality. What you're doing is cherry picking a few folks in the same way that Caleb has been cherry picking different, different uh, ways of talking about different things. But fundamentally, the vast majority of what we're seeing out of the GOP is a party in Washington, D.C. and Washington State that does not reflect the values of the people who live here and does not reflect uh, bipartisanship. And in fact, does not even reflect the partisanship of the Republican Party historically in Washington State. It reflects an extreme agenda and in every way imaginable, they are trying to push through a very extreme agenda. I mean, part Gina, of when you see something happen that's bipartisan in the in the legislature, does it does it give you does it make you happy to see that the parties could work together? And do you have an example of that? Well, Joni, there's a, so how are you defining bipartisanship in that case? That means people are voting for something. That's great. It doesn't mean that it could be public support or the two parties working together. That's how I define it. it. Either of the definitions that we've been discussing. Right. It doesn't mean that Republicans did any work on any of the bills or any of the lift to make sure that these policies are in place. So let's think about something that's really important for Washington state, which is broadband and having broadband throughout the state of Washington. It's a rural issue. It's an urban issue. It's a suburban issue. It's an equity issue. It's a systemic racism issue in many ways as well. It, broadband uh, and the bills that are passed through there have gone through with the support of both parties. But would I call that bipartisanship? No, it's not as though the Republicans have been advocating for this in any way. They happen to vote on those particular bills. That's fine. That's just not true. I it, want to hear Caleb on this. Republicans I want to hear Caleb. For the, well, that's not true. The Republicans haven't been it, fighting it, for broadband. Is, Jacqueline Maycomer has been advocating for that for years. I mean, she's a representative from northeastern Washington. She's been meeting with cable companies, met with the president of Microsoft, has been advocating for it in the legislature. So. I know you don't want to give any credit to Republicans for anything, and apparently that goes like it's so countercultural for you, but it's just not true. So you can't spout lies about what Republicans aren't doing when they are doing those things. I am really tired of the lies coming out of the Republican Party about what they're doing and how they're advocating for any of these sorts of issues and for the fundamentals of democracy. Look, this whole whataboutism. Uh, in terms of trying to compare this is absolutely but is absolutely wrong. And Joni, you went back to talking about partisanship and this idea that I think is really bad that partisanship is bad, bipartisanship is good. Partisanship is is something that is essential to a functioning democratic system. You know, uh, in any healthy society, people are going to disagree about what they value the most. Um, whether it's liberty, equality, community, and even when they agree on values, citizens are going to differ about which priorities and policies best advance them. So, but if you want to have um, agreement on certain fundamentals, uh, and that has to be a shared commitment to the truth, a shared commitment to an electoral system that values the truth and not lying about the system when you lose. You have to make sure that all voters, all voters are part of that system and that the elections are not rigged through voter suppression. The disagreement, progressive versus moderate, uh, ambition versus incrementalism, you know, that's been described as dysfunction. It's not. In fact, it's the beating pulse of a healthy party and healthy debate. There are people within the Democratic Party, to go back to your earlier question, who provide ideological energy, like our own Pramila Jayapal, who chairs the Progressive Caucus. At the same time, we have folks who um, are looking at issues uh, and how to balance and compromise and achieve those goals, like our own Susan Del Bene, who is the chair of the New Democratic Caucus. So the Democratic Party comes from this from a place of value. We have both of them on our next show, so we're excited right. about that. But um, OK, I want to solve these problems and not lying about the fundamentals uh, in terms of our, our entire system, 
what's constitutional, and what makes sense to gain access for all people. That's Caleb, the- do, you, do you have an answer to this, or do you, um, or I'll move along to Well, I mean, else. just a real quick, again, it's rich to be lectured on all of this by somebody whose party spent the last four years claiming that the 2016 election was rigged by Russia. So, like, you can't now say all of a sudden that, oh, we're, we're, it's irresponsible to not immediately accept the results of an election. The, the Democrat narrative for the last four years was that it was totally rigged. That's a whole other lie when the intelligence oh. community is telling you all of these things. Here is the point, again, in terms of values and accepting the truth. You're going to say anything that makes the case for you and this idea that all the lies that you've told over the last four years somehow can go away and have no sense of either um, accountability or no sense of responsibility. I, I want to talk about getting getting to the middle here for a second. I, you know, you can't go to the middle, though, Joni, without... Well, just, fundamental- just hear me out. Just hear me out. Just hear me out. Pollster um, Stuart Elway um, has always described Washington politics for a long time like Neapolitan ice cream, one third Democrats, one third Republicans, one third independents. So I called Stuart last week and said, you know, that's in the background. That's what you've said for a long time. But what about now? And now the numbers are um, Republicans are at 24 percent. Their all time low was 18 percent in 2009. Democrats are at 40. They're all time low, 25 in 1995. Independence, 36. So, Tina, don't both parties need the independence? The independence, that's a big number. Those, don't both parties need to moderate to capture them when people are voting? I think what we need to do is make sure that we are doing the work to have the best government we possibly can to take care of people. Um, And that you you start that again with free and fair elections in terms of who's elected and who's making those decisions to do that sort of work. I think from a Republican Party standpoint, I mean, um, you know, you have to be in a place where it does make sense for for individuals within their own towns, within their own cities. It's it's a joke, though, to hear Caleb talk about uh, fiscal prudence when Trump increased the national debt. By Again, $7. Tina's uh, going to talk about Trump, dollars. talk about D.C. and try and smear every Republican. Apparently, from now until the next, who knows, Tina, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you're not going to talk about what's actually happening in Washington state, what Republicans are actually doing, what right, Bruce which is Stanmire has done right. in Pierce yeah. County for the last four let years. Him, let him finish. Executive. Let him finish. But, what Nate Nearing is doing in Snohomish County, like you're, you're trying to smear Republicans with a national narrative because that's how you think you can win elections. So you're not even willing I'm, to have an honest I'm intellectual making, whoa, whoa, whoa. debate. We're going to have an honest what conversation. What the policy is whoa, whoa. in our state, what the policy is in our community. You just want to smear people with a national political brush. And that's a disservice to our democracy. Like so, so Caleb, have I have a question for you. What the issues yeah, are here I, locally, I have a question for you. What's facing our communities? What's happening in Olympia? And Republicans will win on that debate. So I, I have a question for you, Caleb, on the numbers that I read you from Stuart Elway. Um, you know, does your party, since you're, you're not at your all-time low, but you're at a low, does your party need to do some soul searching itself and reaching out to independents because they're such a big group? What does that look like? Well, absolutely. I think as as the the Republicans that I've highlighted, I mean, Kim Wyman won with 53 percent. So she was appealing to independents who trusted her to administer elections better than the Democrat challenger and better than Tina four years ago. So Kim Wyman has won those independents. You look at the local level, Bruce Dammeyer won in Pierce County with 55 percent. And so Republican candidates selectively do win over independents. And I think that is a model. When we talk about the problems in our communities, the problems at our state level, and we offer pragmatic solutions, that's the path forward for Republicans. And what I would hope is that Democrats will have a good faith debate and discussion about those very real problems and listen to the voices of the people of Washington state that are represented by Republicans. Lauren Culp got 43% of the vote. He got 1.7 million Washingtonians who were voting for him. They deserve to have a voice in our state government. They deserve to be heard as well. And that's what Republicans are representing and who they're representing. And those people deserve to have a seat at the table and deserve to have their voice heard. And that's why the Republican Party is going to continue to exist and to continue to advocate for people that have those types of concerns. 
to that point, I have a question from the audience from someone named Casey. Uh, and it's for both of you, but we're going to run out of time so tight here. Do you support ranked choice voting and allowing additional parties into the current two-party system? Tina, you go. Um, you, uh, from the uh, platform of the Democratic Party, uh, we are supportive of looking at ranked choice voting and implementing that. State uh, Secretary of State Kim Wyman, the Republican, has made it clear she does not support ranked choice voting. So there's a bill going through the legislature right now to look at ranked choice uh, in a variety of jurisdictions. Obviously, many cities have had it. State of Maine has had it and made it work. So uh, we're definitely we're looking at ways to increase participation of voters in Washington state. Caleb, your quick take on that. So my quick take is I live in Pierce County. We had ranked choice voting in Pierce County from 2008 to 2015, and then the voters did away with it. It was confusing in Pierce County when you had vote by mail. We ended up with a guy named Dale Washam, who was like a multiple time candidate, ended up working his way through, and he was a disaster, and he totally um, bombed our Pierce County Assessor Office. So. I think there's some concerns there. Philosophically, I'm okay with the idea, but I think it, in practice, there's some, some things that have to be ironed out. A lousy implementation doesn't mean that the idea was bad. It means that it was a lousy implementation. Well, it was implemented by Democrats in the Pierce County Auditor's Office, so I don't know if you want to go attacking people, Tina. It was so hang on. In, in the interest of um, moving along and trying to get rid of some things that are sort of you know, causing us to be less civil. What about the role of social media, specifically Twitter? How does that make all of us um, sound less like we like each other? Caleb? I mean, I, I think that uh, social media with sound bites, uh, with dehumanizing the people that you're talking to um, or talking at, um, I think is, is a disservice in that regards. I think that we're... If we're going to find agreement, if we're going to solve the issues pressing facing our communities, it's going to be much more effective with people face to face. Um, and that's if you want to bring people together, if you want to diffuse polarization, it's going to be people talking to people at parks, talking to people in their community. And that's when we're going to find that we actually agree a lot more than we disagree. When you're just uh, attacking people on Twitter, uh, which is often what Twitter descends into, uh, clearly, that's not going to help solve any big issues. Uh, Tina, I'm going to ask you something because I kind of cut you off there trying to steer the conversation forward. Um, and I, I'm going to come back to it. something you said. When you and I talked, you said this and you said this a little bit tonight. We are in an adversarial situation. But being adversarial doesn't necessarily mean lack of respect. So how how do we get people to realize that, that we can disagree and still be speaking respectfully? Well, you have to start with the truth, right? I mean, that's a, a component of this. Uh, you, you think about what Caleb just said a minute ago about Twitter and how, and honestly, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, the, the, um, the party at the national level or the party at the statewide level, the person who's at the head of it uh, sets the tone. So in this case, if you look at the tone that was set by Donald Trump for four years, Caleb did not object to a single thing Donald Trump said on Twitter. He did not. That's not it. true. That is not true. Well, let's ask him. Did you object to anything on Twitter? Yes. And I, I was asked yeah. about it multiple times. On, I was asked about it multiple times in the media by Brandy Cruz, by Jim Bruner at the Seattle Times. And I, I uh, specifically spoke thing. out against some Wait, of well, let's, 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 No. What did you, what did you? Like, I don't agree with them. And I did. I mean, so for you to say that I didn't is just not true. You did not speak out about those tweets. You didn't say the tone and the tenor of the tweets. You didn't do that. You look yes, at what I did. from the people within your own party and you don't speak out about those things. And to me, this is the part of this that is kind of so absurd. The Republican Party is trying to fight for some relevance. It's fighting for its life. It is a party that uh, has been marinated in talk radio and conservative media. media and their unifying goals are not making people. What about that? What about the role of the media? Uh, Tina, when you and I spoke, you talked about, uh, you know, it was a 24 hour news cycle. Now it's a 24 second. It's a little, you know, hyperbolic, but but it's really fast. And the media is possibly contributing as well. 
Well, uh, and the and it's being used, right? The, the Republicans have found that their unifying goals are really attacking outsiders and owning Democrats. That was the whole point of Caleb and his conversations here today, is to try to gotcha and own Democrats. But at the same time, let's go back to the issue of the truth and what I started my comments with, which is the commitment, if you want to have a functional democracy and you want partisanship and functional bipartisanship to work, you have to have the commitment to abide by the results of free elections and don't lie about them. You have to be able to tell the truth about those elections and you have to make the commitment that all citizens have equal opportunity to participate in the electoral process. And I have to ask you to hold that thought so I can um, close in a timely way. We have been discussing bipartisanship, even reconciliation with Tina Podlodowski from the state Democrats and Caleb Heimlich from the state Republicans. We're coming back next month with two leaders for the Democrats in the U.S. House, Representatives Pramila Jayapal and Susan Dalbene. They are both from our Washington congressional delegation. Thank you all so much for joining us and good night. We're back on the Civic Cocktail live stream to take a few more viewer questions for our guests. And we have one, uh, Amanda, for both guests. Is it important to you in leading your parties in Washington state to fight polarization or work toward bipartisanship? Who wants to go first, uh, Caleb? Well, I would say uh, yes. I mean, yes, in the sense that I, I was born in Washington. I care deeply about this state. I care deeply about the future of our state. I have three kids that I'm raising here in Washington state. And I wanna see a functional state government. I wanna see functional local governments. Uh, and so in my time at the state Republican party, uh, we've tried to focus on finding solutions and frankly, advocating for those solutions, which I think is going to yield to more electoral success for Republicans in Washington state. Uh, but also just a better state, better state to live in, a better state uh, to raise a family in and a better state to grow up in. And so I think that um, having a strong Republican Party, if I were a Democrat, would be a good thing. Like I, I based on that conversation of the last 45 minutes, I don't know if Tina has talked to many Republicans, but you're you cast a lot of judgments on what Republicans think and what Republicans do and what Republicans believe. But that's not the Republicans that I'm talking to. And so I think that- Tina, who was the last Republican that you spoke to? Uh, I, well, in person, pre-COVID, obviously, um, in terms of those efforts and, and working through those things. Um, because we have been in a pandemic that because of Republican inaction, we have been stuck in our houses for a year. Half a million people have died. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people have been infected because of that. So uh, come on, let's let's talk about what needs to happen in order to be able to get to a place where we can agree. And one of those things has to be how we approach our values. And it's very clear to me this evening that the values of the Republican Party, um, as they're constructed today, this Republican Party, not previous Republican Party, certainly not Dane Evans Party, um, is not in step with what the majority of Washingtonians want, with what people want to see happen in their cities and towns. So uh, this is a place where, why are we seeing people win these elections? Why do we have historic majorities in the Washington state legislature for Democrats? You, why do you we don't. have a diverse legislature ever? You have one legislator of color in both of your caucuses. It's it's a joke. But you don't have historic majorities. You have no, bigger majorities just 14 years ago. It's a joke, Caleb. When you start to talk about how you represent everyone in Washington, you don't. The historical misogyny, the historical racism, the historic homophobia, including yourself and the work that you've done. You talk about your three kids. I'm an out proud married lesbian of uh, with three kids. You have opposed my adopting my kids. You have opposed my marriage. And, and the Republican Party in their platform still does the same thing. So please don't start talking about the fact that you say that you represent the people of Washington. You do not. The Republican Party is completely out of step. Caleb, do you want to go back to that? Or I have an audience question for you. 
Do you want I mean, to address that? I think that, again, Tina is going to claim to pass judgment on what I believe, what I think, and what apparently every Republican thinks, which is not fair. Number two, um, she's incorrect. They don't have historic majorities. In fact, they just lost two, two rural Democrats, which is now a dying breed. In the last four years, they've lost the 19th legislative district, the Senate, the Senate seat, and both House seats. And now they are consolidating more and more in King County and urban areas and ignoring the concerns of rural Washingtonians. And so well, they, 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 there is a voice that happened in 2010 when we go through redistricting will show just how strong Democrats are. So let's let's fight that one out at the ballot box in 20. Sounds good. Okay, well, that's I'll a good spot that. for it. So uh, John has a question, an audience question for Caleb. He says, Lauren Culp was a populist and got populist protest votes. Do you think he was qualified to be governor? I think he would have done, I voted for him. I think he would have done a better job than Governor Inslee of listening to the concerns of a lot of people. In I, what I way? I, in what way? I think Governor Inslee is, uh, is now finally championing opening schools um, now that now Biden that, but, is in the But White he has House. the vaccinations. He's not sending them in without the vaccinations. No, it's, but I think that, one's well, foot no, the other. We don't have, not everybody's been vaccinated yet. No, no, no. But what, what happened? Pushing. Just two months ago, Governor Inslee said teachers weren't going to get vaccinated. And they well, now you have a president who said now that it's the, the vaccinations yes. are coming faster and that he wants the states to vaccinate their teachers and open their schools. Right, correct. And I, I agree with that. I, I'm good with that. But without the vaccines, the Republicans had no COVID response, did not deliver on the vaccines. It's we did deliver on the vaccines. No, there no, were over a million again, vaccines a day lie. being performed in the last couple of weeks of President lie, Trump's presidency. Caleb. There was over it's a million vaccines fact. being delivered each day. It's That's the fact. It's a lie. It's, no, it's a fact. It's untrue. I'll send okay. you an article. What what kind of article? That de de demonstrates that we I see. Pres President Trump started Operation Warp Speed, worked with those three companies to de to <laughs> deliver the vaccine joke. that was developed and delivered before President Biden got his vaccination before he even got sworn in. So you're so, saying that we didn't have vaccines? I mean, that's a lie. No, there were not. President Biden has made sure that there will be 300 million vaccines available by May of this year. D Trump and the entire GOP did nothing. In fact, you had Senate candidates who were trading stocks and making money off what happened with the app, uh, with the epidemic. That's why those two lost in Georgia. So uh, please don't try to rewrite history around these sorts of things. I'm not rewriting history, but the fundamentally, fact the fundamentally, the facts the are the facts. And, yes. you, and you are living in an alternate fact reality when you talk about the pandemic and that sort of opportunity. Everyone should have the vaccine. We need to make sure that that is happening quickly. That never would have happened under Republicans. So um, our audience is, is, is after you today, Caleb. They, uh, Peg wants to know, how do the Republicans propose to fund desperately needed programs without fair progressive taxation? Well, our state has record revenues still coming in, and your, your Democrats have even admitted that they're pushing this capital gains income tax, not because they need the revenue. If, if the, that, that is in the news. I can send you that article, too. If, the, if, if Biden and the Democrats pass their COVID relief bill, the Washington State, Washington state is going to receive $7 billion in new money. We already our revenues have increased by 2% during the pandemic over the last year. Our state revenues have not declined one bit and we're, Democrats are still pushing higher and higher taxes when they when they don't need them to balance the budget. Republicans yeah, in the state our, house with Representative Drew, can I finish? Can I finish? Is, no, our, if, you, if you will only admit that our tax system is upside down and the lowest earners amongst us pay the highest percentage of taxes so, if, so Republicans have a solution to that. They fully no, they funded the. They don't. They will not tax the rich. No, they funded. So the Republicans have fully. Republicans released a budget where they fully funded the working families tax credit, which would address those making fifty thousand dollars or less and alleviate their tax burden. So, if you actually care about that, then let's do it. Let's get the Democrats on board and follow Representative Drew Stokesbury's budget and fully fund the working families tax credit.
So here's a couple of things about the tax credit and working through this. Number one is I, I, I don't think we have an income tax. So issues related to the tax credit are, are sort of interesting to talk about with that. At the national level, your party refuses to fund a working family's tax credit that would actually come off your income tax return, which is what everyone has been working for to make that happen. Democrats have been looking to fund uh, that, that particular tax credit at the state level for a very, very long time. So please. Uh, yeah, and Republicans have let's not done compare it apples so to well. apples. You're, you're so I thought, I thought we were going to have a much um, uh, softer kind of conversation. So I'd like to know from both of you, what would it take to to soften these adversarial differences that we have? What would it take? Each of you tell me one thing that the other party could or should do that would soften um, the relationship, the feelings towards each other. I think that I said that earlier today, right? You said truth. I said, well, no, I said, I really sort of need Caleb to do three things to stop the big lie within his party, which is happening right now throughout the entire state. And I'm talking about the state Republican party. Again, plainly declare that Joe Biden was legitimately elected. And he did, he and did do that. He, he did not say legitimately elected. He said, elected. I mean, I don't know if he said every word you said. He said he was elected. I, and he's I, again, but this is, goes back to the very I first thing I said. Tina's, Tina's premise is that I have to do everything she wants in order for things to move forward, which Caleb, is absurd. Caleb, no. What I'm it saying is. is there should not be any debate over the fact that the president was legitimately elected and people who are still perpetuating that lie, which is the Republican Party, People in your party here in Washington state, Joshua Freed, the chair of the King County Republicans has started a King County Election Integrity Committee, right? Are you opposed to election integrity? Do you Come not? On. It's not that? about election integrity. You know what it's How about? How do you know? Have you been to their meetings? franchising voters of color. That's exactly what it's about. And that is not what it is about at all. It is exactly what no, it's, it's about. Not. It's exactly what it's about. He's saying that mail-in ballots are election fraud. He has said that. Read what he has said about those things. So if we want to get to a point where you turn this down, you've got to stop the lie on what happens with elections. You've got to stop the lie and stop the people within your party lying about elections and lying about these pieces. And you have to denounce voter suppression efforts by the GOP here in Washington. You have to stop those things. Well, I think one thing about the elections that we've been talking about is that we know that our Secretary of State's office does, you know, after the fact kind of testing. That's how we came up with the 0.04% fraud in 2018. So we know that that. Anyway, I got to go to an audience question um, for both guests. With climate change and much needed education and economic development initiatives, at what point can we move forward and focus on the future? That's a fair question. I mean, I was hoping we would focus on the future and Tina wants to look backwards to the last four years. Uh, but I, to answer the one question, I would say that what I would like to see is listening. And I, I think we can do that better as Republicans, but that's been a frustration that Republicans have had with Governor Inslee for the last year is feeling like he hasn't been listening to them and hasn't been listening to their constituents in any meaningful way. Is and that so about the pandemic we, or is that on a different topic? Just in general. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, it per particularly about the pandemic and surrounding reopening plans and anything like that, he was inaccessible to mayors across the state and he was inaccessible to state legislators. <laughs> so having a, that's not just me making that up, that is, that is people, mayors so, of the Tri-Cities, mayors in Yakima, they are literally locally we, elected officials saying we can't get any feedback from the governor, we can't get any guidance from the governor. talk about the difference between listening and doing what you want. The governor has listened tremendously and has steered this state through a pandemic um, as the model state in the country in terms of the pandemic and what has happened with it. Republicans were responsible for the horrible response and have tanked our economy. That's not just in our state, that's nationally. The Democrats put through a 2.2 billion COVID-19 relief bill. The Democrats have made all of those different things happen. So you want to focus what, on what, what bill are you and talking you about? The, the, the two that passed and were signed by President Trump that were bipartisan? Can you please stop? If you want to talk about the future, 
let's talk about what we need to do economically to make sure that our state recovers, that our small businesses recover. Let's make sure that we are uh, ensuring that everyone has a fair shot to vote. And let's look at how systemic racism has impacted everyone in the state of Washington. Uh, even fo folks who are not people of color, but, and look at what's happened in those components of systemic racism and working through it. Let's do the work to take a look at how we recover uh, economically from this epidemic, bring our kids back into school to do this work, all of those different sorts of things. Democrats are doing the hard work of crafting solutions to get us there. Republicans are just lobbing bombs because it's way easier to make that happen as opposed to doing the hard work. And I gotta work. hold you right there. I want to th thank everybody for such a spirited discussion. Uh, we could go on for a little bit longer, but we're going to have to cut right here. So thank you so much and good night.